Hi, so I'm Andy Pernsteiner, CTO for Vast. Um, and, you know, when I was talking with our uh, co-founder about what to talk about today, because he talked yesterday here, he wanted to kind of illustrate what we had to do to build a storage implementation that a customer like CoreWeave could use. Um, and I, I kind of took it from a couple different angles, because it's not just about scale, it's not just about performance, it's about all the other bits and pieces you have to do to make sure that it all works. And particularly when you think about it in the context of a cloud service provider. So if you don't know, CoreWeave is a cloud service provider. So people can rent GPUs in the cloud effectively and run their experimentation on it, run deep learning, run all kinds of applications. But they need to store data somewhere. So they gave us these really simple requirements. Um, and they said, we're going to have thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of servers with GPUs, many tens of thousands of GPUs, um, many, many interconnect points, right? So the, the networking fabric, I put NDR in here, but really it's going to be 400 gigabit Ethernet. Um, the, the, the challenge of being able to get that from a storage system is hard. Um, and to do so while being able to have something that can also scale and do everything else is also hard. The initial requirement is about five terabytes a second worth of bandwidth to go into these GPUs. Um, obviously, they're designing around a design case, right? Real world applications don't always need this much bandwidth, but if you don't design with a ceiling in mind, then you hit a ceiling and users complain or they don't want to pay you anymore. So the other thing that we have to consider is also that they wanted to offer storage services without having to go and buy many, 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 many storage systems. So not only to have high-speed file for POSIX access, which is in many cases required for a lot of applications, but also have object to be able to feed GPUs or even just to do other parts of a workflow that require an object interface. Because many people coming out of schools now are learning S3 as an API that they can use for transferring data. So we needed that. And they don't like to store any OS images on the host. They don't want to do anything on the host that they don't have to. They want it to be very composable. So they're using Kubernetes for everything, which means they need persistent volume somewhere. So they need storage for that. So we had to build for that. Um, and then you know servers have to boot somehow, right? And you could put storage in the servers to boot, or of course you can have something that they can mount. And of course, as you know, NFS isn't able to do a pixie boot for a server, so you need block volume somewhere as well. Um, okay, so those are the easy requirements. Then we have all the other stuff that gets layered on because they're sharing it with so many different tenants. There, there are requirements in place. A customer, a bank, isn't going to upload their data into a cloud provider if they don't have assurances that their data is separate and encrypted from other people's data. They need to restrict how much is in there. They need to make sure that they can go back to points in time, especially when you're training or doing inference. You want to know what the consistency point was that you were training on or that you were inferring on. Um, and I already put block volumes there. That was a typo. Um, and they also need a quality of service because you don't want a single job or a single user or a single application overwhelming the ability for the system to perform. So I'm not going to tell you how we did all of these things. We can have a Q&A session to be able to do that. Um, but the first thing you have to think about is networking. This is just the storage networking fabric. And I didn't draw out all the racks and leaves here. There's many racks and leaves. But this is all non-blocking end to end to get to five terabytes a second. The switches at the top effectively uplink into the rest of the fabric. And then you have tens of thousands of servers on the other side of the fabric that are all having to hit the storage system. Now, if you don't know much about Vast, we've done something a little bit different from what most storage implementations have done, where we've separated the logic and the state from each other. So the logic is on top, the state is at the bottom. Effectively, what we do is we have a series of enclosures which have some number of SSDs and other types of persistent memory in them, which allow for all of the logic layer containers to be able to access all the NVMe devices as though they were local. This is important because we can scale the performance of the system independently of the capacity, which is important for cloud service providers who don't know exactly what their needs are before they happen. Um, it also allows us to not worry about what happens if there's an upgrade or a failure at the top layer of the stack, because there's no data that's owned by any one of those containers. But it needs to be able to scale to exabytes. Now, the system that we deployed at this initial site is not exabytes in size, but it has the potential to get there, because nobody knows where it's going to go from here. So, the other challenge that you have is how do you take a namespace and split it up in such a way that everybody gets their own slice of it? And so when we initially implemented our, our product, we made sure at the bottom layer that we could do multi-tenancy. We didn't do all the features up front. We had to wait until customers actually needed them. But effectively, we can segregate per tenant isolation based on VLAN, based on network, based on all of these things. And we can extend that to allow for tenants to have their own encryption keys, their own file system routes 
all while assuring that we can get data reduction across tenants if we so choose. So one of the big key tenets of VAST is that we reduce the amount of capacity required to store data. And it doesn't matter what kind of data it is. It could be file data, object data, it could be database data, it could be anything that people store, we reduce it. But when you encrypt data, it's harder to reduce it. So in order for that to work, we need to have our own encryption keys that are stored in an external key manager, where we can then encrypt data using a customer's keys, but we know what the key is so that when we can read it back, we can read it back. And then we don't have to worry about what happens when you try to encrypt, uh, when you try to reduce encrypted data. Now, let's talk about all the things, right? So a cloud service provider needs not only high-speed file, they need high-speed object, they need block, they need Kubernetes storage, they need lots of different components. And so if you start on the upper left and work your way to the right, you can see what the vast data store has implemented. Now so far, I've only talked about the store side of things. But we're much more than that. And so what we've also done is we've created on our own platform a database layer. So if you imagine applications that need to store structured data, and oftentimes when you're running deep learning or machine learning, you need a place to store structured data. This is a scalable database that can scale to petabytes in a single table, trillions of records, tens of thousands of columns, and allow fast access using popular open source tool sets, and over time, using embedded tool sets that we will build on the platform as well. In addition, we're introducing a data engine, which can allow for processing to occur directly on the platform without any external management or any external services that have to be created. Imagine services like Kafka that are running directly on the platform that don't have to be built, managed, or protected. There's an there's a element of scale that we can get to. There's an element of efficiency as well as consistency that we can get to that you can't get if you build an external service. Now, in many locations, we will deploy in a customer's data center. In CoreWeave's case, that's what we're doing. But we've also allowed customers to deploy things that are in edge locations or in the public cloud. And we can stitch it together using something called the data space, which is effectively a global namespace that allows for any data written anywhere to be accessible by anybody anywhere. And we've come up with ways to break the trade-offs between consistency and performance such that you can truly have round the world global data sharing without having to worry about where the data was written and where the data needs to be read. Over time, the data space implementation will coordinate with the data engine to allow for functions and code to run based on where the data is local so that we can make sure that any processing that occurs on the platform will be directly where the lowest latency is. And so if you're a cloud service provider and, you need, and a job runs and you want to make sure that there's a global scheduler that's allowing for jobs to run in multiple locations, you want to make sure it runs in the most efficient place possible either for the cost of the GPUs that you're renting or for the cost of the data transfer. So we'll give the ability for people to tune for both. So you could listen to me all day long. You could also talk to people who have already gone down this path, right? And so I've highlighted a few of our publicly referenceable customers. Most of them have a presence in some way at this conference, and they've gone with us in a big way. Now, they aren't cloud service providers in their own right, but if you think about HPC, if you think about AI, it oftentimes does look much like a cloud service provider. You have multiple tenants, you have multiple applications all running at the same time. You need to make sure they get the performance from the storage, from the databases, and from the applications that they think they need. And so I would encourage you to talk with any of these customers about their experience with VAST to understand what the deployments look like and to understand what kind of use cases they're solving for.